Welcome back to RGR. I sure would like to have a beer, but I don't have a vessel to put it in. We're going to talk about canning homebrew today. Thoughts, guesses, and what's coming on this channel because I do have a plan. I know I don't always have those, but today I do. Welcome back to RGR Craft. He's Mike Munhall. I'm Ryan Tracy. How are you, Mike? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm keeping up. Uh, I'm yeah. excited about today because this is like another future future direction that I want to go in. Folks, if you're not subbed, we talk about this stuff every week. We have reviews for you both gear and beer wise. So make sure you go hit the like and the sub and the bell notification. So you know when we do something new because it's happening all the time. Um, one thing that's become a really interesting trend lately is the concept of canning your homebrew. And that is for for longevity, for being able to mix and vary. And I think, honestly, the aging aspect is really intriguing to me. It's not the classic priming sugar, put a cap on it. It's not that volatile is the key. That's what it needs to not be. But really recently, and, and the reason that we kind of shifted this is because canning is becoming more difficult for one reason. I had planned to already have a machine by now. I held off on that because you can't get cans. Even some of the professional breweries can't get cans. Uh, there are a number across the country that, uh, because they buy in such bulk and they buy ahead of time for their seasonals and everything, they have some cans that are pre-printed that either didn't sell that seasonal because of the volume, because of this 2020 monstrosity that it is, and they're actually having to relabel pre-printed cans with wraparound labels in order to put new beer in them. Yeah, that's interesting. What's going on there? Is it aluminum shortage? Is it, it a it is. can shortage? So it's aluminum? It's, it's both raw material and manufacturing capacity because so many breweries, especially in this country, but even around the world, had to go from draught lines to canning instantly in order to try to maintain their viability as a company. Uh, being able to have to-go beer is what's keeping breweries alive in America right now. And that puts so much emphasis on it. Even, even some of the stranger sizes, the 16.9s and 19.2s are harder and harder to find unless you have commercial accounts. So while we're not going to do it for a while, <laughs> I won't even buy a machine for a while, but when we do, we will have that for you as well. But I wanted to get your take on, you're somebody who bottled for a long time. Uh, clearly most of your volume goes into kegs as does mine. But where do you see the differences in what might intrigue you about canning versus bottling? It's a good question, Ryan. I, uh, um, I, I, to be honest, I haven't bottled in forever, right? We talked just a little while ago uh, about, um, you know, my bottling fiasco. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, you can watch that show if you're interested in hearing about that. But um, I, I don't really have anything else except lightly held opinions on the viability of canning and home brewing, right? And same with commercial beers, they're just lightly held uh, opinion on the viability we're like cans versus bottles right i um it seems to me canning's a lot of breweries are obviously canning mm -hmm. i can't think of any disadvantages of using a can an aluminum can over a bottle um and i mean in my opinion maybe you maybe you have some insight here ryan but um canning seems pretty reasonable option um you know it, you not don't have to worry about your beer getting light struck Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, certainly less risk of, you know, a can shattering. Right. <laughs> um, Although leave it to me, I'll find a way. Yeah, you, you will. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, you know, of course, aluminum's far more easy to recycle mm -hmm. than bottles. So, you know, if you're a tree hugger, um, that's going to matter. And it does matter to me. Um, you know, so, you know, you, you could bottle conditioning could still happen right i mean if you re-ferment in the bottle that for carbonation suppose you can still do that in a can right i can't think of any reason why not to it's um, all about pressure man it's all yeah about pressure. exactly i mean it's going to hold pressure just as well as any bottle and cap so um you know i can't imagine why any advantages or disadvantages of glass over bottle do you have anything in mind well, you brought up one of the ones that I'm concerned about. And the reason that I'm, I'm very trepidatious about doing anything monstrous in it is because of those styles where you want re-fermentation within the bottle, not only to carbonate, but for what some beers require in terms of ongoing viability of fermentation of that yeast. It depends on, I think very much so, the difference between a professional cannery with the PSI that they can put into forming that lid can connection uh, how much pressure it will take. 
the machines that you get to use at home are much different in terms of the mechanical pressure that they can apply. And that's one of the experiments that I'm going to do in a very controlled way to see if what I can get to blow up where. Uh, because there are things like, uh, like any of the, the longer living, cellarable Belgian styles that you want to do, even your triple. If you over carbonate that in a can, there is a possibility at the homebrew level that that could explode. And that's, that's not what anybody wants. Yeah. So you think that risk is uh, just as great or greater than if you were to bottle that same beer? That's, that's what I just don't know. I've, I've heard both opinions of it, and that's why we have to do an experiment to find out. Yeah, so. yeah. So what kind of equipment is out there for the home brewer? So, you know, if we, if we go into a brewery, um, you know, our local brewery, they'll, you could walk out with a, um, a crowler, right? Is that mm-hmm. what they call them? You know, yep. just a large can. So they, obviously they can can. Um, yes. singles at a time. I imagine, I'm guessing that the homebrewers cannery would be something similar to that or is it different? It's similar in concept, not in the robustness of them. Um, the crowler machines are either made by, I want to say Ball has one. There are a number of other uh, producers, but they're all people that are used to uh, producing those tin cans, soup cans, coffee cans, the ones that are uh, not only more stout material, but have a much more uh, significant lid roll to them where the actual two materials meet, one being the, the lid and one being the body of the can itself. The two that are most popular out on the homebrew level, uh, one from Cannular that's available at More Beer, I believe. Uh, if anybody's interested in those, we can get you some links to uh, help the channel out and get you a little a little something at the uh, the sites. But the other is uh, it's slipping <laughs> my mind right at the moment. But the two of them, October and Cannular, are the two big ones. And they have all kinds of variations. There's the, the two-lever mechanical where you're actually pressing that. You have to apply the pressure to apply the dye to make that crimp. Um, there are some automatic ones. There's varying levels, but they are becoming more and more accessible to the home brewer. And I think especially if you have a, you know, a beer that's stable, that is, not, that is either filtered cold crashed or or, you know well settled out that you're not worried about any kind of stray pressurization then it becomes about technique in being able to understand not only your machine but how you're setting it up what's the most optimal to do what mobile canning lines do in trying to limit dissolved oxygen and exposure to atmospheric oxygen those are the two big things Um, and it goes back to something that comes from the cleaning process Everyone said, hey, can you drink star sand? Well, you don't want to, but you don't have to be afraid of the foam. Don't fear the foam. I know. That's one of your favorite sayings. Yeah. And that goes for <laughs> filling cans as well. The, the key thing, and I've had, I've had hazy IPAs in cans that looked fine. I've had regular, should be way more stable West Coast IPAs that look like they're a cloudy mess because of the oxygen exposure when you can that beer. And so... I think the key to home brewing, home canning is that you have to have your technique down. And that includes wasting, quote unquote, a little bit of that beer so that you have some foam to cap on right. and eat up that space. Whatever little head space is going to be there, it won't be a whole lot, but you want to fill that with CO2 from the beer, not from atmospheric oxygen in particular. Yeah, well, I, I, I can imagine it would- the the canning technique and the filling would be just like we do if we're bottling from our kegs right so you and i use that blickman beer gun Mm -hmm. um so you can actually inject some co2 into the bottle then then fill it from the same gun you know with the beer from your keg it's already carbonated and ready to go you just fill it and then cap it real quick in a bottle right yep um so i'm imagining the the home brewer's version of a cannery would be very similar right um, I agree. But that's if you are filling from your keg with pre-carbonated beer. Um, you know, yeah. outside of that, I guess it's <laughs> going to be, yeah, you're priming it and just filling the cans just uh, just like you would bottles. I mean, it seems mm-hmm. like, I mean, I can't imagine it'd be any different than filling a bottle. It's just different material and different device to put the lid on. Right. Yeah, I'm really intrigued by it. And I'm also intrigued by the concept of what is a 330 milliliter can from Australia, uh, which seems to be the standardized, what is that, 11.2 ounces or something like that, uh, versus some of the bigger, uh, you can get 500 mil cans. And so does the volume versus something that you are priming in order to, to continue to ferment or to carbonate from 
the sugar in the canning, does the volume total versus how much of that carbonation is coming there, does that make a difference too? So we're going to have to get not only a canning, but uh, a number of different cans as well. Yeah. Yeah. We got to get brewing. I know, man, <laughs> running out, out of beer is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that, that brings me honestly to the bottom line. Is this something that you're interested in? Or is this just a flight of fancy for my, my mental? State? You know what? I, I, I'm, I'm going to be drinking out of my taps, out of my kegs. That's just the way it's going to be. Um, if, you know, it, if I could, if canning was e easier than bottling, I would absolutely consider it, right? Um, there are always cases where I've got that last gallon and a half of beer in a keg and I've got another thing I want to get in there and start carbonating. <laughs> I would love to be able to, to package that and store it, maybe even sell mm -hmm. it, give it some time, right? Um, I don't do that with bottles just because it's a pain in the butt. If it was easier to do with cans, I'd consider it for sure. Yeah. I'll tell you the other thing that is a factor for me, when the evolution of contests changes, and I think that that is going to happen with how much has had to happen because of COVID, of judges being in the same room, doing things via Zoom, uh, like all that. If canning becomes viable for being judged, that will make a big difference for me because honestly, that is the bulk of why I bottle. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I haven't thought about that. It's also been a long time since I actually entered anything into a competition. Um, but yeah, I wonder, uh, you know, generally, yeah, they want what, like two to four 12 ounce bottles for a competition. That's yep. pretty standard. Um, or like for Belgian or other styles that require a different type of bottle, you know, you can, yeah. it's not the 12 ounce <laughs> bottle, whatever you get it. But um, yeah, I wonder if we could just do the same thing with cans instead. I'm really interested to see how that all comes out because there are a lot of national uh, brew competitions that have canceled. There are a lot, a, a ton of local ones. I know there are a few that are some, some of the bigger homebrew clubs are still running their own because they had an operation that allowed them to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll be very interested to see what 2021 brings in terms of the changes, the evolution of, of homebrew contests. Yeah. But that said, um, I need to make better beer too. So that's not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> your beer is good Ryan. your beer is good it, it's good it's that. not great we'll we'll get to great someday um folks if you want to know about a specific type of beer anything that we make or that you're interested let us know in the comments below let us know what you think about canning um i do fully intend to get a canner uh so that we can at the very least be able to exchange beers uh when we can meet so that way uh we won't be driving kegs up and down the mountains anymore is right is right <laughs> <laughs> I, the one caveat that i have is again the supply if that's not an issue do you have a preference like if you were to like you said you have a gallon and a half left or, or even if you have a full batch and it's something like our barley one that you want to age do you have a preference for uh, volume size like what kind of can you would want to use yeah that's a hard one um a variety is good um, you know, when I was bottling, it wasn't uncommon for me to, um, fill, uh, like bomber size bottles and 12 ounce bottles. Um, you know, I, it, I think it would be the same thing with cans. You know, you can find those crowler size ones in normal 12 ounce cans. I don't think I'd have a preference, Ryan. I think it would obviously depend on the style of beer. Um, uh, and what I have on hand, but you know, if, uh, if I wanted more beer, I'm okay opening two 12 ounce cans instead of one larger one. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Fair I'm a big boy. I can handle it. <laughs> I find the sweet spot is whether if I can't handle it, if it's, you know, if it's 12% barley wines and I have 500 milliliters of it, the wife gets a little bit and that's okay too. <laughs> right. Um, right. <laughs> but yeah. I, I do find that I gravitate towards the 500 mils. That's the 16.9s in, uh, in us yeah. measurement. Um, yeah. That's probably where I would start, but I do like your idea. If you could do crowlers at home, I think that's probably the most efficient in terms of, you know, recyclability, how much you're buying uh, the, the aluminum for, et cetera. Yeah. So that's something we'll explore. Um, and it's and less gonna, work. It's less work to fill up crowlers because there's fewer of them at a five right? gallon batch than there would be a bunch of 12 ounce cans. But um, yeah, if you're canning, you're canning, you know? Yeah. So 
it, it's, it's a process. It's not a day-long process like baking the beer, but it is a process. And folks, I do have a video coming for you on bottling uh, with the Blickman that we have both used back and forth. So uh, look for that in the next couple of weeks as well. So that's what I have today. I'm looking forward to the next can in my hand. Thank you guys for uh, checking us out. Uh, Mike, what do you have up? Uh, what's your next brew? Uh, I think I'm going to make a Belgian double. Huh. Surprise, something Belgian. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I made a really nice Belgian double. Uh, I have a good recipe, base Belgian double recipe, but um, I made one last year that was really good. I added some vanilla bean mm. uh, in, in secondary. Uh, I think I'm going to give that a shot. I think that's going to be my next beer. I remember that one. That yeah. your doubles are tasty. Okay, so I, yeah, I will, I'll need you know, six to eight gallons of that. Thanks. What do you burn next? Uh, for me, it is going to be the evolution of the uh, the Kvike double IPA is coming next. I'm going to go. I'm going to go whole hog. I'm going to use one tablespoon of yeast to try and elicit as much of that tangerine orange flavor out of the top of uh, what I'm changing my recipe a little bit towards to try to complement that, both with the hops and uh, the malt bill. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, it'll Good be stuff. Fun. And we'll have all that stuff for you guys. Uh, we'll, we'll start reviewing our own beers. Um, and you can see me tear apart my own creations. That should be interesting. Um, but it'll be just like we're sitting around a table. So uh, thanks to Mike. Thanks for all of you for watching. Uh, we will check you next time. Cheers. Be good.